Um, so welcome everyone um, to, well, what has been a testing so far, but what I hope is going to be an intriguing opportunity to have a deep uh, dive into the career uh, of my guest here today, Luca Silvestrini. Um, before we uh, start, and uh, with an apology uh, to them for the late start, can I please thank a few organizations, because in addition to Protein, um, this uh, conversation is being hosted by a number of other organizations, Yorkshire Dance, The Place, uh, Dance East, People Dancing, Art Stockton, and the Pavilion Southwest. Um, and all of this is being streamed on all of those websites. So um, hopefully we're going to have a few uh, viewers as a result of that. We haven't put too many off. Um, we're hmm. here because uh, Luca Silvestrini's Protein is celebrating... Uh, 21 years, which is a great achievement, Luca. Well done. I know Thank actually you. that um, it's a bit more than that because your first work, Jewel, uh, a duet, um, premiered at the place in January 18. So my maths make it a little bit over 22 years, actually. But, you know, it's still worthy of celebration. So we're really formally celebrating 21 years. Um, since Jewel, uh, and including Jewel, Luca has made uh, 40 works, which is a, a, a great return. Some have been updates, like two border tales. Uh, some have been uh, derivations, uh, building on a previous work. But 40 works is still a hefty repertoire for us to be mm. talking about. And um, uh, it's a lot for us to deal with in just 45 minutes. But I'll obviously try and do my best, uh, as long as the technical side holds up. Um, obviously, this isn't a normal uh, Q&A, um, and so hopefully there will be an opportunity for people to ask some questions. Um, uh, if you put them in the chat box, uh, we can keep an eye on them, uh, and hopefully uh, we can come back to them if there's time, or if there isn't time, uh, Luca has very kindly consented uh, to answer questions outside of uh, this session. So I think that's enough from me. So let's uh, pick up from where we le left off before, Luca, which was me asking you how you personally and the company are coping uh, with the current pandemic, the, the age of coronavirus. It's affecting everybody. I wondered how it's affecting you. Well, uh, on a personal level, um, I've been in lockdown like everyone in London for the last three months, and then I very recently moved to Italy uh, to stay with my mom for a little bit. And as a company, we um, had this sort of normal reaction that all the other companies probably had a uh, bit of concern about the future and not knowing what to do and dealing with a lot of cancellation, postpone, you know, postponing events and activities. Um, but then very, very soon we, uh, we got very excited perhaps about the opportunities of this time and decided not to stand still, but to actually, to actually be active, be proactive and trying to connect to our audiences and participants um, in the best possible ways. So embracing the digital, digital uh, moment and um, with the all ups and downs like this one today. But I think it's been fascinating to be able to discover perhaps and, um, and enrich our capacity to, to reach out to more people as well. And so our celebratory program called Protein 21, it was going already, it was a, a sort of digital project in a way um, but, uh, of course, because of the situation, had a, an extra spin, digital spin about it. Um, so we, at the moment, um, doing a reimagine, which was originally a, a project about uh, uh, asking other groups to reimagine our work. He's becoming uh, a new creation for us. We are reimagining an old, uh, very uh, small uh, film called The Sun Inside. So we have asked people to contribute, uh, send their clips to us, and we're making a new film uh, about the actual sun inside our home during, during lockdown. And, uh, and also Reflect is the other, the other part of our celebration, which is 
about asking uh, people to reflect about that time with us, from performers to um, promoters and, and other friends. And this is actually my reflex with you. And also the last one, which is Remix, is a series of uh, work, uh, company works that we are putting online, available online for people to watch. We started the last month with Border Tales, and we are continuing this month with LOL Lots of Love, which is going to be on, on the 25th of, of June. So, yeah, we, we're trying to be uh, active and carry on as much as possible in this situation. Thanks. I'll, I will remind everybody again at the end about the, um, the digital offer, but uh, I do strongly uh, recommend that people go and have a look at the reflections online because they're very, very useful uh, um, personal reflections on, on the career of Luca over the last 21 years. Um, Luca, I wanted to ask you, you, you came here from Italy to finish your dance training at, at Laban, and you've been here, you've been in the UK for 25 years. I wondered um, if you went back to the beginning of when you first hmm. came here, uh, what you might change or what you might do differently? Um, I don't know, not, not much different. Uh, I wouldn't do anything differently. Uh, well, some, some of it, maybe some of it, but I'm, I'm extremely happy and proud of everything I've managed uh, to achieve over these last 25 years. Um, and I came to dance quite late. Uh, I always wanted to dance uh, as a young person. I didn't have the opportunity. Um, so dance came, unfortunately, uh, late uh, for me. And... Um, and but I, I for me coming to London was about actually um, give it a go, my last chance because it was I was 28, so I went into full time training at that age, and I knew I had a lot to catch up with, and um, I danced since I was 15, but not uh, as I wanted to, and I kept a lot of doors open, doing theatres and dance and other performing. Uh, activities. I come from a performing arts degree in Bologna, and 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 then it came at that point in my life when I said, I just have to go and try to make something out of my passion, which is dance. And I I think I I've managed in my own way, and I'm extremely thankful about everyone I've met along the way, starting from all the teachers and people. Uh, from Laban, Trinity Laban, and uh, which uh, who that, they encouraged me, they helped me to, um, you know, keep up and and believe in myself. And um, and then of course uh, Lee Anderson, who I met uh, uh, when I, when I was in transitions, and she asked me to join the Fanchers straight after my um, at the end of my two years at Laban, and that of course. Uh, it was a great opportunity to develop as a performer, as an artist. And, and then, of course, Bettina, who I met at Laban, and we decided to, uh, we had a, we, we find a connection with Bettina Strickler, the other co-founder of Protein. And uh, we decided to, and actually it was my request, I said, why don't we make a piece uh, together? Uh, there is a, a fantastic opportunity at the place called Resolution. And why don't we apply and make a piece? And that was how uh, Duo came about, in, in, and we presented in 1998. Um, and that was the beginning of Protein. And then when I, when I reflect about the last 20, 21, 22 years now, um, I just think everything went so quickly. Um, almost like uh, it's, it's quite shocking when you have a bit of time to look back and think what happened. It's like waking up from a dream or sort of, um, and of course, a lot have happened. And I met a lot of more people, uh, incredible people that helped me to, to get to where I am now. So I guess there isn't very much I want to change. Of course, when I look at every specific moment, there might be moments when I thought, oh, maybe I should have said no. Uh, I should have said more no's, uh, and I can't say no to people uh, or to opportunities. Uh, I should have been more, I don't know, uh, sometimes uh, less perfectionist on things. And, uh, um, 
and also work less hard. I, I'm a really, I work very hard mm. and sometimes that puts a lot of stress on myself and the people around me. I mean, there is a good, uh, you know, there's a good result, but sometimes, so going back, maybe those things I might, you know, do, you th do different. Do you think that because you came into dance um, relatively late, although when you get to my age, 28 is still very, very young, <laughs> uh, but so because you came relatively late, do you think that accounts for uh, how quickly you decided to start up your own company? Did that come before Jewel or did it come out of, working with Bettina. I'm quite interested in how you started the company. Well, no, it became, um, uh, it became an, the, the, um, my passion for making work was already there during my university time because I was part of a collective of, with other students, with university students, so we started making our own work, which was more like physical theatre work. And then, so my passion for creating work was already there. And during during my love and time, um, I think by studying choreo choreology and choreography, I became more and more interested. And then the company came as a necessity because, uh, well, it was a necessity in the sense that we had to give each other me a Bettina name. We didn't want to call uh, this the Luke and Bettina company. So we had to kind of create a company uh, which um, was protein. But we didn't have a sort of, um, until we actually, uh, we, we started, until the de debut, I don't think we knew that this was going to happen. So it was because of the result of that first performance mm -hmm. and the opportunities that came afterwards. Then, then this, this idea of, okay, we have a company now is, to begin with, it was just the two of us. And then we started to open up to other people. And um, our third piece of work was like a sextet. So we have, we have another, we have another four people to deal with, and um, and so it's kind of, um, and I, I I don't know. I sometimes ask, say to young maker, don't worry about forming a company too soon, because um, it might be a distraction to your uh, practice, to your to what you want to do, and to achieve. Um, and I don't know if that's, uh, we made the right decision, but it, was a, it wasn't, there were opportunities there, but also we were very looked after by organizations like Grange Dance or The Place. Uh, they really helped us, Swindon Dance, so many, they sort of supported from the beginning. So we never felt lonely or, or under too much pressure. Yeah, so it was really a means to an end at the beginning rather than a deliberate mm. entrepreneurial yeah. decision. And where did the name come from? Well, we we were looking for, we were interested in interested in uh, work that um, um, in the idea of changeable, interchangeable, uh, mutable, and turning the everyday into something more extraordinary. Um, so we were looking, both me and Bettina, uh, being foreigners and not not English. So we're looking for a word that could summarize that concept. And we came about the, um, the definition of protean from the god Proteus, and, uh, which has this idea of interchangeable and mutable. And, uh, but we, we decided that protean was not very accessible as a name, but it sounded like protein, which was more accessible, more about the everyday. And, and also proteins were, you know, it's colorful, they're colorful, uh, lots of energy, lots of movement. So we thought, okay, let's see. But it was just a name put on, a, on an application form to begin with. And then like every other name stayed. I was thinking, I'll turn now to talk about your work a little bit. And I was thinking about how I would categorize your work because looking through the, the rep, I've seen, I think, eight or nine of the pieces. And I mean, if I was to do that in a sim simple sentence, I think it would be, um, to say that it focuses on human nature um, and I guess very important uh, at this particular time during the age of the coronavirus, how uh, people tend to cope socially, uh, morally, emotionally when they're facing uh, big issues. Um, do you think that's a fair assessment or, or what drives your motivation? I think, I think you, 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 you know, it's the, the, the right is the right, you know, uses the right words. I mean, I, I, 
when I think about what I've um, what interests me, what drives me to make work is goes always to people, people and human nature and how we tend to relate to each other, relate to the world outside us. And especially when we are face to face with big issues and big important issues. Um, and so I think it, what you say sounds uh, uh, very spot on. And, uh, and I think we, I don't know, I, I, I think probably that's why I still create work in, in find a sense of connection with people and um, looking sometimes often to, to the world around us. Uh, I sometimes say the everyday, but uh, it's more, the everyday can have, a, you know, something quite profound, uh, which is about how we cope with life, basically. And also about the innovations around us, what's happened to uh, uh, the temptations or the distractions or the challenges. And, um, and for me, that's where theatre, theatre in a way has this sort of great responsibility about, um, you know, uh, putting us, uh, holding up a mirror and make us reflect about who we are and what we do um, without giving necessarily solutions, but at least to sort of make us aware and, and, and provoke our thinking. And then, of course, there's also the entertainment element. I think... I always think that it's important to go into the theatre is a good night out, you know, however provoking or challenging the content is, but it still has to be about uh, also having an, an interesting and uh, good night out as well. Yeah, the, the other thing that always strikes me is that um, you're dealing with these big human issues, but it's not as if it's an us and them, it's a, us, the performers, and them, the audience. Um, I mean, you have quite a strong track record of, you know, bringing in diversity to your performances, li liaising with local communities, particularly often with the less visible and, and, and more vulnerable groups. When did, when, when did that come about? And will that always be a feature of your work to, to open up, to bring communities in, to be part of it? Um, I think when I reflect about this aspect of Protein's work, um, uh, the engaging with uh, different communities and different people. Uh, we are working not just with professional dancers, but with participants from uh, diverse communities. Um, I think it comes from the, uh, it it's touches upon my, my personal uh, journey. I think I, I'm pretty much uh, sure about, and I could be a, a living testament of it, of how transformational dance is, the, the, the discovering and practicing and creating and performing dance. And, and this sense of transformation and, and, and empowerment that happened to me, for me was a real uh, change in my life at the age of 15 when I walked into a dance studio for the first time, uh, being my desire to be there. Um, and I can see that this has the opportunity to offer that to many more people. So it's never too late to start dance. It's never to, whatever other things you do in life, uh, it's, it's, it's a good way of getting in touch with, your, with yourself and understanding and discovering a little bit more about yourself. I mean, the arts in general um, does that, but I think dance has that more direct way, being the embodiment of yourself in a way through your self-expression. And, um, and I think maybe my interest comes from that, but also from the fact that the, I want the work to be about people, connecting with people and uh, reaching out and, and um, uh, yeah, helping somehow. And so uh, that's why we have this um, incredible amount of work we have done over, the, over two decades of work with uh, different communities, sometimes working with us, with the company, directly with our dancers, sometimes separately. Um, yeah. You must build up a, a rapport because you're traveling around, you've got, um, you know, theatres and organisations that you're dealing with a lot. There must be the same people coming back. So it's almost as if you're building up your own little local hmm. communities. That must be fun. 
Absolutely. I mean, uh, some of the uh, participants from projects uh, we've done over the years, uh, they're still coming to see the work, they stay in touch with us, uh, not just here, but also abroad, because I've done quite a lot of community-based work in, uh, in uh, Europe and in other parts of the world. And it's great, you create your own community of people and you're trying to, and you feel like you have a bit of responsibility as well to kind of how you engage with them, how you stay connected, especially during this time, actually. Yeah. Uh, that's why we came about with the Sun Inside project, to actually say, guys, we're here and uh, you can be part of this and we can stay connected and we can create something together, quite beautiful. Um, so, yeah, I guess it creates a, a sense of wider community uh, around what we do. Mm. And the other issue, of course, is that your, your work is um, often th focused on big socio-economic or uh, even political uh, themes like consumerism, uh, body consciousness, <laughs> uh, online obsessiveness, immigration, etc. Uh, and although each of these works has a very profound uh, aspect to its core, uh, there's always scope for humour. There's always humour in your work. <laughs> and it's often through the extensive use of spoken text, which clearly comes from this mix of your performing arts background and the dance uh, background. Um, I mean, could you comment on that particular style, how you've tried to evolve that? Um, uh, you know, what are you trying to achieve with your particular brand of dance theatre? Um, I don't think humour, it's, it's an interesting as, you know, thing to reflect upon because somehow I don't search for, for it. I'm not looking for it. I'm not forcing it. But I seem to be interested or attracted to. So even in rehearsal, when things happen during improvisation, I seem to sort of spot the potential uh, humoristic moment or a moment of lightness. And, and for me, humour, it's an interesting one because it's only, you know, it somehow hides something deeper, um, something, uh, uh, I don't know, something tragic sometimes, you know. And it, it's very much connected to what Pirandello used to say about uh, the... Um, that is, 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 is how it's, it's an important, it's a more important, you know, he, he used this idea of the older lady, an older lady with makeup on trying to look younger. So your first reaction is basically smiling or laughing. But as a second, as a, in a second moment, you must have been concerned or wondering what brought that person to, to that, you know, to make that decision. Mm. So I think there is always a second a second moment within you laugh about something and then you think gosh am I allowed to to laugh at this and um and I think it's a powerful it's a powerful tool and also you can you can say important things really important things with with a sort of light touch sometimes and and it's a good way to reflect as well yes yeah, so big I mean, issues I'm, I'm thinking while you're speaking about border tales which I saw again recently where the, where the central character is unquestionably racist but he doesn't realize that he's racist and he's trying his best not to be racist actually and it's a really <laughs> profound subject but actually there's there's a kind of undercurrent of humor in it which actually somehow improves its impact um you know it makes it even more noticeable uh so i, I think that's i understand what you mean about that and i think humor mm -hmm. helps sometimes to make the point doesn't it um yeah, yeah. I, th I think it's um, it's it, it. And again, it's not um, a particular technique or anything that I'm thinking ahead. It just seems to come very natural to me. Um, and and there's something also I spot on the performers I decide to work with. You know, that ability to um, to use uh, very cleverly uh, humor and. Um, because it can be a powerful tool. Mm. Do you have, I mean, obviously the number of themes that are uh, causing a great deal of concern within society are numerous at any one time. But <laughs> I just wonder what, um, you must have a store of these ideas that you want to turn into dance theatre, or is it just, you know, you, you, you obsess and focus on one 
and then when you've done that to death and you've made your piece and improved upon it do you then move on to others or is there a, is there enough mm. uh, are you a bit like mark morris and there's enough work there to last another 50 years uh, or, or or are you just dealing with one at a time i think it's more one at a time i don't i don't have like a, a pile a pile a store pile of ideas um and i think i'm very much um re uh, reacting to what's happening around me most of the time and and i u usually these pieces are coming from a personal concern or a personal inquiry or something that happened to me affects my life directly so there is something autobiographical as well in every in any of this work I've made. Um, and, and it comes from the desire perhaps to investigate, to understand a little bit more, because it's bothering me. So I'm thinking, I, as an artist, I have to, as a, human, as a person, as a human being, I, I have that desire. And I feel as an artist, I'm sort of um, amplifying or making this uh, the subject of what is uh, uh, my, my, my work. And, um, and, I, and I think for me, it's very important also to bring along people uh, in whether it's a performers or collaborators uh, that actually are thoroughly interested in, in the subject matter I'm putting there, I'm offering uh, in the first few days of rehearsal or during auditions. I'm, you know, I feel like I need to be surrounded by people that actually have the same concerns or perhaps different, but still feeling very passionate about why we are unfolding and opening up this, this sort of subject matter. Mm. And, uh, and regardless of what we want to do with it, but I think it needs to come from a, a, a personal urge um, to, to um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it struck me also that you do like to revisit work um, from time to time and update and sometimes that revisiting sort of changes the work. I mean, I'm particularly thinking about May Contain Food, which I I saw, you know, where everyone was sitting around at tables and the, the, mm -hmm. the performers kind of fed you while they performed, but that actually became May Contain You, didn't it? So that work sort of evolved over a period of time and became something else. Uh, is, that, is that some, you know, is that the, uh, I suppose I'm thinking about the fact that you've got such a large repertoire a lot of those pieces uh, were performed when they were performed and, you know, they've kind of, they've, they've dropped in, 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 you know, back in that time. I mean, are they, are those works um, catalogued? Can you revive them? Uh, or is there, a, are there some that you would like to revive and others that you'd like to tuck away in the back cupboard? Um, yes, I, I think what is fascinating, that piece of work, I mean, I wish, um, looking at the past, that we had stayed longer with a piece of work, but um, sometimes it wasn't possible. There was a period of time, a long time ago, when the Arts Council was not interested in revivals or um, they were more interested in new work. And, uh, and also, if you're a project funded organization, you feel more the pressure of making new work. And now we are not, re we are revenue funded companies, so we, we can have more, let's say, the capacity to decide of what to do with, with a piece of work than before. Um, but interestingly, what you talk about may contain food, it, was, uh, it went through may contain food, may contain food, may contain you, and then may contain you. So it's like three different pieces. And, um, and I think it came, sometimes this opportunity comes from, this decision, sorry, comes from opportunities. We were asked to turn may contain food, uh, which is a big show with eight people, uh, lots of props and uh, we turn a theatre into a restaurant basically and with a set and food in it and everything and we, we are, we've been asked to actually turn it into a smaller piece uh, into a duet for a rural tour and, and I straight away I thought fantastic this is a great opportunity to maintain the same the, the same keep the same ingredients um, and, and actually make another show out of it that actually can travel to areas where we can reach and we can bring theatre in areas where actually there isn't very much going on and we actually serve more people um, with the show. And then the same 
may contain you, may, con may contain food, may contain you, then became may contain you when we turned that duet into a, uh, a version for care homes. So then we start touring that piece in care homes for the elders, and, uh, which of course had to be readjusted. Um, so I, I find this very fascinating that you can, from one piece of work, which takes a lot of, lot of time, lots of efforts, lots of money to make a piece of work, you can actually create more, more affiliated pieces and, more, and, 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 and also develop the work by doing that. Mm. Um, I mean, I, I think the, the idea of reviving, the other example is Border Tales, that we, we had a version in, the, the original version is in, it was made in 2013 and toured in 2014 only. Um, and then we put it away because, because of money, because of other things were coming on. And, um, and then there was an opportunity again. It's again about being responsive and respond to opportunities from the BBC world that they, they wanted to, to, to have the show uh, or a version of the show, a smaller version of the show for a program about identity. And, and that gave me the that was a couple of years later. And they gave me the sort of, um, encouraged me to think, actually this piece of work is, is amazingly relevant. It's more relevant now than the one it was first made. And, and, um, and so that's what we decide a, a year after and to, to make a new version as, you know, of, of the piece. And then we had another two years of Border Tales uh, touring um, around the world, been at the, at the Fringe Festival for a month run, and um, and that was helped by the time. And you know, time really changed. It was a Brexit time, mm. and and of course the piece became incredibly relevant. Um, so I guess, yeah, I I feel interested in not letting the work die or put it away, and perhaps find the right opportunity to bring it back has to be a reason yeah. somehow. Also because we are not a rap company. We don't, we don't have dancers on a full-time uh, contract. So it's quite difficult. Each time you have to call back this, the dancers that might be busy doing something else. Uh, they're all freelancers. And um, so sometimes we, the opportunities might not be there because they're busy doing other things. Yeah. 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 Uh, incidentally, Luca, while, while you're speaking, I can see all the messages coming up on the screen and, and when you're talking, talking about a particular work, people are saying, I love that show, I love that show. So <laughs> there's a lot of Great. coming from the audience. And actually, this is not a question, this is an observation really, but it does seem to me that shows like The Big Sale, LOL, V for Body, and of course, Border Tales, they're, they're, they're all about issues that, I mean, The Big Sale was made in 2005, uh, uh, B for yeah. Body and Dear Body, 2009, 11, something like that. But they're all about issues that even though they may be 15, 10 years ago, those issues are still actually very relevant today. So I, th I think that's an important thing about your work. They don't really date. Um, you know, they're still as relevant today. And we've seen that through the, the digital season that we're seeing. And one of the things I wanted to, uh, mm. perhaps I was going to bring you for the end, but I bring it up here because you just mentioned it. Um, is the digital season because one of the things I was very pleased to see you mentioned your dancers are all freelancers, um, but they're actually being paid for the digital shows that you're you're performing. And that that can't be easy in these times, but it's a laudable uh, achievement, I think. Yes, we decide for um, the streaming of our work, full length work to actually um, pay royalties to to our dancers um, and collaborators because. Especially at this time, if you're a freelancer, you, you know, you're not doing particularly well. And I think uh, it was, a, you know, the minimum we could do to actually honour the their work they've done with us. And to not feeling like, OK, we're using, we're using this content uh, without taking, taking into account that uh, there are people out there without work at the moment. And it's tragic knowing that there are so many beautiful, amazing dancers out there not being able to shine on stage. Yeah. That is heartbreaking. And, and so therefore, that's what we decided to do. So each piece that we put online is in partnership with a venue, with a national venue. 
and uh, we ask them to give us some contribution, contribution that comes from, from protein and from them, and all their money goes to, to, to pay their royalties. And, uh, and this is absolutely nothing, there's nothing to earn from us. I mean, and these this screenings are uh, free anyway. Mm. Um, but it's, uh, it's about keeping, keeping the work, not just protein's work, but the work of these amazing uh, performers out there, uh, because that's where they need to be, you know, and they need to be seen. And um, they have yeah. such an important role, you know. Yeah, well, we, it's, a, it's, yeah. it's great. And, and it is such a terrible shame, as we, as we all know. I mean, many people are, are suffering, but dancers' careers are not long anyway. So to lose uh, half a season uh, or half a year is, is dreadful. But actually, talking about your dancers, um, and having seen a lot of your work, uh, one thing that really strikes me is that they always require diverse skills. You know, being a great dancer is, uh, is certainly not enough to appear in a, uh, a Luca Silva screaming piece. I mean, they, they need to be great at movement, of course. Uh, they need to be characters and they need to be able to deal very comfortably with uh, spoken text and often spoken text and complex movement at the same time. And you've, you've, you've obviously worked with a lot of the same dancers uh, over more than one show. And as you say, you don't have a company in terms of dancers on staff. You're picking freelance dancers for each work. But I just wondered when you're making work nowadays, whether you have particular people in mind for roles or whether you make the roles and then you choose the dancers to go uh, for, the, for the role that you've created. Um, I think it's a mixture. It's a mixture of things. In the, at the very start of Protein, when Bettina and I, we formed the first company, um, I remember we kept uh, them for a few years uh, on different projects. And, um, and it was more, yeah, and, and then, of course, there were all these new people coming in. But there was always those few, I remember Natasha Gilmore or Esther or Jean Abreu. Um, they sort of, you know, they carried on with us for a few productions. Um, and then in time, I sort of became a little bit more aware of the sort of, the, the sort of skills, but not, not just technical skills, but the, the personalities, uh, the different personalities, different backgrounds that one performer can bring into the show. So I started to, during auditions, to find the right people somehow but not for me it's about um it's about connecting with the person first more than the the performer or the the dancer and um and i think that's what i'm looking for i'm looking for uh pretty unique people that sort of um attract me as human beings first and not that the technical level or the skills the amount of skills that person, they're not important, they're very important. But on top of that, I think my first, um, I, I direct my attention to something which is unique about that person. Often is, is a sense of vulnerability, uh, not necessarily the ultimate confidence, for instance. Um, and also, yeah, as you said, I, I look for people that are interested, not necessarily skilled at the start, to actually talk and move at the same time or to do other things, you know. But at least they're interested, they're curious. Um, and, and as I said earlier, also, people that seem to be really passionate about the subject, that they've got something to say, because the, the work gets created collaboratively. Um, it's co-devised work. I just provoke the situation in the studio. And if people don't have anything to offer, uh, to bounce it back, to actually provoke me, challenge me back, so it, it won't work. And, and I've been really lucky, uh, fortunate, and probably also skilled in find those people that actually were able to um, really um, challenge me in the studio with their, with their responses. And also that they were ready to open up their, their lives, their experiences, their backgrounds uh, to become part of the show. Mm. Um, that's another important element, you know. Some of these amazing characters, uh, 
that we see during uh, some of the proteins work, it's they're, they're, they're sort of stage characters, but they sort of, they have some connection to the personality of that performer. Um, and um, which, which, uh, which is always interesting, I found, because it comes from somewhere deeper. So it's not constructed, it's not added on. It's actually, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's somewhere there. And sometimes I feel like uh, I need to create the uh, conditions and the, the, the environment for those elements to come out and, 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 to, and to serve the, the piece and the, char and the character. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to take this opportunity actually to send my love to all the performers. I've been, so many of them, I worked over the, with, with over the years and um, I'm pretty much in contact with all of them. Uh, a few of them, they sort of disappear from my, they, they, we're not connected anymore, but only very, very few, only a few of them. Um, and I regret that I let that go, uh, all of that happened, but I'm, I'm so thankful to all of them for having given more than just a, um, a few hours of rehearsal and, and a few tours, uh, given part of their lives to, to this. Um, there are a few so, of yeah. them sending messages through now, so you'll be able to catch up with that later. But that's a nice thing to say, Luca. I think that brings us pretty much up to almost the present time, actually. And one thing that's really intrigued me is that after more or less 20 years of making work based on uh, human interest and socio-political kind of themes, you suddenly decided for the first time ever uh, to make a work on a pre-existing narrative, certainly the first time you made a work based on a piece of literature. So what was it that attracted you to The Little Prince? <laughs> um, that is a funny one uh, in terms of, it came at a very interesting time in my life as well. When I, life as an artist, as a, as a maker, when I don't think I had a, a sort of urgent new idea uh, in mind, and I was approached by uh, Brendan Keeney at Dance East and Eddie Nixon at the place, um, asking me, uh, this is a few years back now, must be like at least three or four years ago, maybe four years, so what about, uh, have you ever thought about doing a, a, a show for a family show or Christmas show? Um, I said, no, I haven't, and, uh, but I'm, I'm curious to know why you're approaching me for this. Um, and then, of course, the reason, well, your work is brilliant and all of that, and I think you'd be doing, you, you, you could do some, some amazing, uh, very magical piece. And um, so then I, I said, I was intrigued by this idea, and they asked me to think about um, a piece of work to turn um, into a family uh, suitable Christmas, but sort of family show, and and that was the con that was the parameter. So the piece had to be connected to a well-known story, uh, because that's that's what you what you do. You know, you, you get an audience also because of the title that you're using. And I went through a lot of uh, possible ideas, and I went through the most almost the most conventional ideas you can possibly think as a as a Christmas show or a family show. And, and then all of a sudden I kind of thought that actually there is one, one fable, there's one story that uh, has really uh, a deep meaning to me. And I, it's a very interesting book. It's a very interesting story. It's not a children's story. It's a, it's a children's story for adults, and, um, and which is The Little Prince. Uh, uh, which I discovered when I was a teenager, and it stayed with me. I read it many times, um, and it's, I think it's one of those books you always need to keep it there on your uh, by your side because it's always good to go back to. Um, so then I proposed this, and they accepted it. They said, "Well, if that's what you, that's what you, where your passion is." Um, so that's that's how it came about, um, and, and it was a very different different process. Um, of what I'm used to. Uh, that's also where I, um, I had to cast people according to what I found in people being the right character. Oh, you are the little prince, or you are, um, 
uh, for someone I offer this to Faith Prendergast. I say, for me, you are the little prince. Um, I can't see anyone else um, here that can actually do this role. And, um, and um, so I, it, was, it was interesting. I think it was um, nothing better or worse than making uh, a device work. But uh, it was certainly different. And it was a different way of getting lost in creation somehow. I always get lost when I make work because you're dealing with the unknown. And um, so you, you, you kind of enjoy getting lost and then find your way again or discovering a little bit more things that you haven't thought at the beginning. And with The Little Prince, it was a little bit like that. I mean, we, you know, it was about turning a book, a story, not even a, a play or a drama into, into a show. And, and, um, and of course, there was a narrative there ready for me with a beginning and end, uh, with developments. And, but it was still fascinating to try to dismantle that and recreate. So it, it's, um, it's something that I might like to do again. I don't think it's a, it's a change of direction, a complete change of direction. Um, but I certainly something I love to explore again in the future. Um, and um, it was good. It was good. And it came out, it came out well. And that's, also gave me more, um, gave more um, enthusiasm for the future to, to repeat. And actually, just a second, by talking about The Little Prince, I forgot to mention, I, I mentioned the performers, but also want to mention all the other amazing creative minds I work with when I make shows and uh, composer designers and um, all of them, because without them, the show wouldn't we, the, this show wouldn't be the same um so it's about it's about the combination of me the performers and the creatives in the studio yeah uh, creating this i'm just reading a comment from stuart waters who says uh, it fitted well into the queer cabaret scene i i, I completely get <laughs> actually i could never think of the little prince now without thinking about faith uh, Prendergast, because she was so obviously the little prince. I mean, it was a really complex uh, story for you to take on for your first kind of literary effort. In fact, I, there is a there is a, an anecdote about a, a southern uh, a ballet company in southern France that was asked to commissions to do a, a little prince, and they actually ended up not doing it because it was too complex. And you managed to do it, make make the story right, and do it on you know a, a relatively small small stage and I think you've got a version that can even be cut smaller haven't you that can go on to an even smaller stage yeah we, we we repeated the experience of turning a show for rural version for rural tour uh to go in smaller venues and 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 we created a little prince in smaller venues which uh, was very very successful and we managed to turn a massive set into tiny, tiny set um, and um, maintaining the costumes and, and the whole piece. Um, so it was really fascinating again to, to do that exercise of reducing, parry down and um, b b without losing the magic or without losing the, the, the core elements of it. Um, and it's been great to take it to, to other, to different communities and different parts of the of, of, of the, the country. Uh, Emma from Protein has reminded people to um, uh, share any questions they've got. I saw one that just came through a few mm. minutes ago. It's the only one I've seen actually, but it's the obvious one really, which is what can you tell us about the future uh, plans for Protein mm. and or for Luca Silvestrini? Right. Um, ooh, that's an interesting one. <laughs> Expected. I did I say, say what can you tell us? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, um, it's interesting. This time came uh, um, as a. It was always going. To, it was always going to be a reflective year for us, because we wanted to take time to dedicate uh, the our main our activities to celebrate the history and and what we achieved so far. Uh, pay tribute to everyone from the performers to people who has helped us to the participant to um and so, so somehow uh, it was always time to to reflect and time to um pose in a, in a way uh in terms of creating new work 
And, and now we're looking into, there's a couple of ideas for the next two or three years. Um, but I think we're going to start, um, we are planning at the moment to start from an outdoor uh, new piece. And that, well, more than a piece, an experience. I can't say, I don't want to say too much at the moment because it's still, uh, but it's something to do about bringing people out and being in the outdoor, engaging with the environment. And, and, and it might also, this was already there as an idea, but we are certainly embracing it more as we might continue to be in social distancing or physical distancing mode. Um, so next year there will be this new, I would say, outdoor experience. Uh, and then in the next couple of years, a new stage show about not based on an existing narrative, going back to a uh, device work. Um, I might start doing some R&D this summer. And it's a subject that really uh, I care a lot about. Uh, it's quite personal. And, um, but again, I don't want to say too much uh, at the moment. But, um, and also we have um, all our other strands and work that we'll carry on doing um, like Invisible Dancing, that is something that we've been doing for now 10 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, the work we uh, do with uh, pupil in pupils in referral units, with young people, uh, we're going to make a new work with refugee and migrants next year. Um, so there's a lot of uh, other uh, projects coming up. Well, that's good to know. Um, good, good to know lots of, lots of projects and lots of ideas still. Yeah, it's not the we end. Will, we, will, we, it's will, only... we will look forward to hearing about them on the 25th anniversary, I, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> I'm looking at the questions, and there aren't any questions coming up, actually. So hopefully we've dealt with what most people wanted to hear. And I think we've probably had our allotted uh, 45 minutes. So um, I think, Luca, uh, I will just start to uh, close with a couple of remarks. I mean, first of all, thank you for giving us the time i hope people have really enjoyed it i think your uh, your charm and your uh, your sense of adventure and creativity has, has come over in the last 45 minutes um just for people's benefits this is going to be uh, kind of permanently on the facebook uh, uh pages of protein and a few of the other platforms i think immediately after this uh, interview is finished and uh, no doubt an edited version to get rid of some of the technical uh, issues we had at the beginning will be coming uh, to uh, the Protein website and also to the YouTube ta channel um, in, in the near future. But I think most importantly, what I wanted to just uh, recommend uh, is that LOL, uh, which I had the great uh, privilege to see again uh, recently, and as I said earlier, it hasn't aged at all. It's still absolutely as relevant today as it was when it was when it was made, uh, with fantastic performances from the the whole cast. Um, it's coming to YouTube on the 25th of June, which is a Thursday. Uh, as Luke has already said, the dancers are being paid, so that's a wonderful thing. Uh, and it's going to be on YouTube for the whole weekend. So from Thursday, the 25th of June, through till Sunday, the 28th of June. And if you're thirsting to see um, work by Luca Silvestrini, then you don't have to wait too long. Uh, because you'll be able to go and see it uh, uh, on YouTube on the 20th. And can it, people can connect to our website, I think, and then into YouTube too. And this and the show is going to be on uh, for the full weekend. So we start on the at seven o'clock on the twenty fifth, and it's going to be on for a few days. Yeah. So uh, hopefully, a lot of people will join us there. Well, hopefully, um, we can have a watch party at seven o'clock. I like those things; they're, they're good. And also, <laughs> don't I, I want to uh, just remind people too that there are other reflections uh, from uh, artists who have collaborated with Luca over the last twenty-one years, uh, and they are you can get those on the website. So I think with that, Luca, um, thank you very, very much. I'm sorry again to those of you who endured a few minutes of uh, technical problems. We don't know what, what, what caused that, but thankfully, third time lucky, uh, we've been able to present we managed. the interview. We managed. So thank you all. Um, enjoy. The rest and thank you to you, Graham, oh, for being thank such you. a great host. Great. Thank you. Uh, enjoy the rest of the evening. Uh, and um, yeah, but goodbye. Thank you.
Bye-bye. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.